The Honourable the Prime Minister. Ask the further question, please. The, uh, leader of, the Leader of the Opposition. Yeah, thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I seek leave to move that so much of the standing and sessional orders be suspended as would prevent the Leader of the Opposition moving forthwith the following motion, that uh, the uh, Minister for Higher Education and Employment Services no longer possesses the confidence of this House. Yeah. Order. The, does the uh, Honourable Leader of the Opposition asking for leave or moving a suspension? I'm seeking leave to move. Is leave granted? I'm leave. seeking leave. Well, move. Okay, I move. I move that the that so much of the standing and sessional orders be suspended as would prevent the Leader of the Opposition moving forth with the following motion: that the Minister for Higher Education and uh, Employment Services no longer possesses the confidence of this House. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, it's uh, the uh, the evidence the uh, at the activities today of of this House in question time are indicative of, a, of what is the single most important failure of the, uh, the Hawke government, and that is the complete shambles and complete lack of authority that has been demonstrated by the Prime Minister in relation to his ministers. His ministers, in fact, take it now almost as a God-given right that they can speak out and take any public position on any issue, irrespective of the decision-making processes of the government. And what we saw today in question time was a minister deliberately trying to, uh, to uh, duck the authority of the Prime Minister in relation to his responsibilities as a minister of this government. And indeed, it's been a basic uh, tenant, Mr. Speaker, of the, of the um, practices of the Westminster system of government that there are very clear cut standards and procedures in relation to the uh, concept of ministerial responsibility. Yeah, yeah. And might I just read, uh, Mr Speaker, from the um, House of Representatives Practice Second Edition, uh, page 87, in which uh, the, uh, the following uh, quotation appears. It has been generally agreed that among the principles implicit in the Convention is that each minister is required to abide by the following. That is that he or she must be prepared not only to refrain from publicly criticising other ministers and their actions, but also to defend them publicly or else resign. It is as clear-cut as that. They must be prepared not only to refrain from public cri publicly criticising other ministers and their actions, but also to defend them publicly or else resign. And on several occasions this afternoon in question time, Mr Speaker, the Minister for Higher Education and Employment Services was given the opportunity to publicly and without qualification support the government's decision in relation to the third runway and he chose not to do it. In fact, he, he went as far as he could, I believe, in the context of question time to maintain his independence on that issue. He, he went as far as he could to maintain his independence by drawing attention to the fact that the Prime Minister's uh, description of the decision-making processes in relation to caucus and in relation to the Cabinet on the third runway decision were, not, were only essentially accurate, not totally accurate. And then, of course, uh, he refrained from giving the unequivocal commitment that is required of him in his position as a minister to publicly support the position of a government. Now, we know, of course, that this uh, decision that has been taken by this government is, uh, has had a very long and chequered history in relation to uh, uh, showing a degree of, uh, of, of sustained inactivity on the part of the government. It was a decision that we had taken in government back in 1982. Uh, Wal Fife, the uh, now leader of uh, opposition business in the House, then as minister, uh, took that decision. Uh, the government took, took that decision to government and uh, supported the construction of the third runway. This government then ran in 1983 in opposition to the third runway decision, and has then uh, spent the rest of the, the uh, last seven to eight years fighting and scrapping amongst themselves to uh, try and get that item back on the agenda and take a decision which should have, should have as I say, was taken in 1982 and should have been taken uh, at, any opportunity, at any time through there, particularly as our economy went into the worst recession in 60 years and there was a desperate need, a desperate need for this government to come to grips with the economic malaise of this country and show a bit of leadership. But right through that period, this issue has fundamentally divided this government. And what we've seen in recent days is a Prime Minister who is so fundamentally weak, so fundamentally weak and, and lacks uh, the necessary authority to continue as Prime Minister, unable to pull his ministers into line on issues as important to this nation as the third runway. 
And indeed, this is just the last of what have been a series of uh, public displays of weakness by our Prime Minister, where he's allowed members of the Cabinet to speak openly and to criticise his uh, position, to differentiate their position on major government policy issues, and, uh, uh, and he's been unable at any occasion through that period, as he was again today, unable to pull them into line. Just in the last couple of weeks, for example, we've seen Senator Richardson, who's uh, publicly uh, criticised the Prime Minister and his leadership on several occasions, either directly or indirectly, in his role as campaign manager for the ex-treasurer, uh, the major leadership contender for uh, the Prime Ministership of this country at the present time uh, from, the, from the ALP. And secondly, this week, of course, we saw the Minister for the Environment uh, publicly announce that the Prime Minister would be making a statement about the government's position on the State Premier's proposal for revenue sharing. Two clear-cut examples where the Prime Minister has had every opportunity to pull these people into line and, of course, has, uh, has refrained from doing so. So this example today, Mr. Mr. Uh, Speaker, is a clear-cut case, a clear-cut example of what has been a succession of prime ministerial and ministerial failures that goes to the very heart of this government and its inability to govern this country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this, this, this minister, the Minister for, Employment, uh, for Higher Education and Employment Services, has willfully and knowingly, I believe, breached the agreed uh, principles of cabinet responsibility. It has come to our attention that in the course of yesterday evening, for example, after the Cabinet and caucus processes had taken their course, the Minister was on radio, quoted on radio as saying that he was not bound by the Cabinet decision. He went out to knowingly to continue to support a position he had taken against what became the government's decision on the construction of the third runway at Mascot. And uh, in, called into uh, to account in the parliament today, he was unable, he was unable or unwilling to confirm publicly what he's, he is required to do under the responsibilities of, uh, of uh, uh, under the agreed principles of cabinet responsibility, and that is to publicly support the uh, position of the government on a decision like that. And I think it's pertinent to recognise, Mr. Mr. Speaker, that the minister in question, who is being censured, hasn't got the sense of decency and sense of propriety and uh, hasn't got the, doesn't give Parliament its due, pro, due place uh, in, in, uh, in uh, this uh, public debate, that he has left the Parliament at this particular time not prepared to face the issue of censure for his, his unwillingness to support. Now, the position, Mr Speaker, is clear-cut. If he is not prepared to come out and publicly support this decision of the government, that the government has taken to uh, go ahead with the construction of the third runway, if he is not, to put, if not prepared to put aside his own personal views, and I might say he seems to have been given a particularly um, wide berth in being able to put those personal views, both publicly and privately, up to the time the decision was taken, but he is not now prepared, now that the decision has been taken, to publicly stand up and defend uh, defend the government's position, to give unequivocal support for that position and to go out and defend that position, then he is left with no choice but to resign yeah, under yeah, now what are well-established yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and well-agreed uh, principles of uh, ministerial responsibility. Now, I think it's interesting, Mr Speaker, that there's probably more to this issue than has emerged in the course of question time. When the, uh, minister, when the minister said that he thought the Prime Minister's description of what had happened was essentially accurate, he was tipping us off that, in fact, uh, there were other elements to that uh, agreement that had been reached with the Prime Minister that hadn't yet come to light. And I think it's interesting that, in this regard, uh, the, uh, an ex-minister of this government, the member for uh, Barton, Mr Gary Punch, uh, was on television this morning on uh, the Today Show, and he was asked uh, the question by Mr Liebman, who sold you down the creek then? Well, it is reopening old wounds, but I had undertakings from the Prime Minister that weren't honoured and that is simply the truth of the matter. Now that begs the question. That begs the question as to whether the minister, as to whether the minister for uh, higher education and employment services, feels similarly cheated by our prime minister. And I'll tell you what I think that deal was. I think the deal was that he would be allowed to campaign publicly before the decision was taken against the construction of the third runway. Secondly, I think he was allowed to speak in the uh, cabinet meeting and to put his case. And I think the third part of the deal and the important part of the deal, which has in a sense been 
uh, exposed here in the parliament today was that he could continue That's to right. speak and to right. campaign against that government's night. decision. Yeah, right. And if you look at what he said last night on, on radio, Mr, Mr. Speaker, uh, when he uh, asked about can you ask the following question by a journalist, can you campaign against this? Mr Baldwin said, and I quote, I am not bound by the Cabinet decision, and my view is well known, and my views are, I am sure, um, you are all familiar with them. Right. And a very clear-cut case that he says he is not bound by the Cabinet decision after the government had taken its decision totally and after he'd, given, he'd, he'd had his opportunity to put his case. So from that we can only conclude one thing, that there was a deal with the Prime Minister. There was a deal with the Prime Minister, and they hoped they would sneak by yes. on the basis Order. of him the not being called to the The Minister has, has no expired. choice but to resign. Is the yeah. motion yeah. seconded? Yeah. The Honourable the Leader of the National Party, yeah. second in the motion. Mr Speaker, I second the motion and say the only charitable interpretation which can be put on the fact that this Minister is so cowardly he's not in the House at this time yeah. to deal with this motion yeah. is that he's gone back to his office to type the letter of resignation which is owed to this Parliament. There is no doubt that the principle of Westminster Convention, Cabinet Solidarity, has been totally breached by the action of this minister, not only in the last 24 hours, but in fact in the two and a half years, remembering it was in March 1989 that the Federal Cabinet made the initial decision to proceed with the third runway and to proceed with it subject to the environmental considerations. Principle became clear cut when the member for Sydney accepted his portfolio position and then decided to mount a sabotage campaign against the third runway at each and every opportunity, using his position as minister, using his entitlements, his additional uh, staff resources to mount a major campaign against the fundamental decision of the Federal Cabinet of March 1989 to proceed with the third runway. This minister has breached that principle Memphis. then every week Every week he's been a minister, and more so in the last two days. And in supporting the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition, I want to just highlight the very real nub of this matter. Yes, the Prime Minister gave a, uh, some sort of deal, some sort of deal to allow a Cabinet uh, entry by this outer minister, to allow this outer minister to come in and argue the case against the third runway. The second aspect of that deal, we're told, was that he was also allowed to then go to caucus and continue that debate. But the third aspect, which the Prime Minister indicated, was after that caucus broke, after that decision was taken, he, the Minister for Higher Education and Employment Services, was bound to the Cabinet and caucus decision. And indeed, the Prime Minister added, and so are all the other caucus members such as the member for Barton, such as uh, the member for Laurie Verdon's seat, and the speakers, <laughs> Kingsford, Smith. Uh, Kingsford Smith, and indeed uh, the member for Grandley. But, but the truth of the matter, the truth of the matter is that it is after the cabinet decision, that it is after the caucus decision, that we now suspect there was a further deal. And that further deal was that the minister had a very special exemption to go back to his electorate and continue to oppose the third runway decision. And that was the answer the minister gave to the first question by the Leader of the Opposition. That's the nub of the matter, that he had a very special deal to in fact go back to his electorate and say that because of our very major concerns about the implications of the issue for our electorate, we were, and I quote the minister's answer from that first question, we were permitted to do that on the basis that we would not be bound by that cabinet decision, and that was an explicit undertaking in the Prime Minister's deal. Well, some deal, an unbelievable deal, a total breach of the Westminster Convention, and one which should bring this minister back onto the floor of this House to stand up and just utter a few words, I resign. Now, I mean, the member for, St. Uh, for Barton. The member for Barton had the courage to do that. The member for Barton was honest enough to do that. The member for Barton resigned over this very issue, and yet this minister skulks away to his room. And I do hope that is to write that letter of resignation this parliament is entitled to, this prime minister is entitled to, if he had the guts to demand it and demand a bit of discipline of his cabinet. But we all know, 
This uh, Prime Minister has let go on the matter of Cabinet solidarity and discipline. The Minister for Social Security can go and play golf with the Prime Minister in the morning and then spend the next day and night knifing the Prime Minister behind the scenes and counting the numbers. The Minister for the Environment can go off and torpedo the new federalism process. Minister after minister can breach Cabinet solidarity. This minister has been caught red-handed by the questions of the Leader of the Opposition, yeah. red-handed at breaching Cabinet solidarity. This minister should now resign. Yeah. resign. The question is, is, is order. Order. This is ridiculous. Order. This is ridiculous. No, I'll, ask the, I'll ask the of the House to resume yours the seat. Are the stupid tactics. I'll just resume the seat. I'll wait till I come. No, I won't order. wait till I stop crying. Until members of the opposition can remain silent, I won't call the leader of the house. I'm no more. The honourable leader of the house. Having watched your moronic performance in question time, when you got your questions out of order, as far as I can see, the last pe last bunch of Member people I take advice from on parliamentary tactics is you lot. Let me uh, let me just dispose of this very quickly, uh, Mr. Speaker. The simple fact of the matter is here that there is no case to answer, and the reason the reason why. The reason why we took the, uh, take the unusual action uh, of, uh, of allowing this to be debated through as a, as a suspension of standing orders rather than take on the censure motion is a bit, as a matter of courtesy to the Leader of the Opposition. He moved that the uh, standing orders ought to be suspended. Normally speaking, we would accept a, a censure motion where we thought that there was any particular point in it, and if we weren't going to accept it, we'd knock off a suspension of standing orders without debate. But because it is the Leader of the Opposition moving it, uh, we, we allowed him to argue out his point on a suspension of standing orders. As I've had occasion to remark in the past, this Opposition has massively deva devalued the censure motion process. And uh, therefore, it is a, it, they have put themselves in a position where it is impossible to take it seriously. And when they are absolutely 100 per cent dead wrong on the answers they themselves were given in question time, the notion that this government ought to find itself in any way uh, under any sense of obligation to accept a, uh, accept a censure motion from them, is, uh, as far as we're concerned, goes straight out the window. As I've had occasion to remark here before, what a difference from the days of Bob Menzies, when you'd, you'd get about one censure motion to Parliament. We cop about one a week here, on, uh, on average, from the opposition. Okay, Basically, not because um, there is substance to it, not because there is substance to it, because of the ignorance of the parliamentary and governing process of the opposition. What did you have here? What did you have here? You had the Minister for Higher Education, the Higher Education and uh, uh, whatever it is. The leader of the National Party. Come into this place. He was asked a question. Do you agree, effectively, do you agree with a statement made by the Prime Minister, the analysis of events by the Prime Minister, which concluded with the fact that the Minister was bound by any decision taken by the caucus on this matter? The Prime Minister made that clear. Every member of caucus, including the Minister for Higher Education, any member of caucus is bound by the decision taken by caucus. It is confirmed by the, the person who, uh, the, who, was, uh, who was the concern of this censure motion, the Minister for Higher Education. That's the end of the matter. If the Minister for Higher Education had got up here and said, oh no, no, I'm not bound, I'll, uh, I, I don't accept the caucus decision or whatever, then that would create a different situation. That was not the Member answer Keogh. that you got. When he was first questioned by, uh, by you, uh, you folk on the subject of, uh, of, of what his attitude was to the Cabinet decision, which was the first question to him by the, uh, the uh, Leader of the Opposition, he said, I did not support the Cabinet decision. And this was taken as a very meaningful statement by all members of the Opposition. Oh, ha, ha, he didn't support the Cabinet decision. The man ought to be sacked immediately. Well, for the information of honourable members opposite, he is not a member of the Cabinet. And when, the, and when, and when in a, under our rules, which you well know, under our rules, which you well Member know, for Higgins. When, when a matter is debated subsequent to a cabinet meeting in caucus, all members of the cabinet are the bound to Mayer. support that position during the course of caucus discussion. Other member, people who are not members of the cabinet are not bound to support cabinet decisions when caucus discussion proceeds. Then, then, 
when we come to the conclusion of a, uh, of a consideration by caucus, uh, then the rule that we have that applies to us is that all members of the caucus are bound by that decision. And, uh, and that includes, because we have taken a caucus decision on the subject of the third runway, every member of this party, including the member, Minister for Higher Education, is bound by that decision. And he then confirmed it for what well, he did. In the, answer to, in the answer twice to you, he confirmed that. Because the explanation that I have just the member given, for the explanation that I have just given is precisely the question. Precisely the question, and that is that uh, you asked him if he was bound by it, and he said, and I've just given you exactly what the prime minister said to you. Leader of the National If you're Party capable of understanding what was put to you, and he confirmed that that was the case, i.e., he Minister is bound McCullough. by the uh, decisions that are taken by the caucus. Now, the fact of the matter is, and this is another important uh, part of that procedure, because if a junior minister, under our rules, if a junior minister comes into the cabinet and participates in the whole of the cabinet debate, uh, I warn oh, the member for Mayo. Me. But with, with all due respect to you, you are not the arbiters of convention on your side of the house. You are the breaches of convention on your side of the house. We don't accept. We don't accept any particular set of your definitions of what a convention is. I'm, I'm telling you exactly the processes that we go through, and that is this. Member if, a member, if a member of uh, the junior ministry participates in a full cabinet debate and uh, proceeds to the uh, conclusion of that cabinet debate, then he is as bound as any cabinet minister by that process. And, that's, uh, and, therefore, and therefore, if Mr uh, Baldwin had stayed in the cabinet for the conclusion of the cabinet debate, then he would have been in a, he would have been in exactly that position. Oh, right. He would have been bound as any cabinet minister in the subsequent discussion in caucus. The member but, for Flinders. But because he was not there, when the matter subsequently came before caucus for discussion, he was free to uh, vote and do as he pleased in that regard. So let's not uh, let, let, let's, let's, let's not cavil at these uh, these sorts of things. As far as you're concerned. You mucked up your tactics on your questioning in there, and we're not going to allow you. We're not going to allow you any particular award that you don't deserve from any of the answers that you have been given. You have been given straightforward answers, and the conclusion and the conclusion of those answers is this. The conclusion of those answers is this, uh, unrepudiated, and that is that uh, members of caucus, are, are all of them, are abiding by the caucus decisions. That were taken in uh, that were taken by the uh, by the government at that stage, but they are, as individual members of caucus, of course, entitled to take any particular position on this sort of issue prior to that point, and of course they utilise their rights to do so, and they utilise their rights to do that publicly, and uh, and of course that placed the uh, that placed the uh, minister for higher education during the course of the last not couple of weeks, I suppose, the last couple of years on a collision course uh, with his uh, colleagues uh, and uh, the rest of us when we had decided that, subject to a satisfactory environmental outcome, uh, there would be a, uh, a, uh, a proceeding with the, uh, with the third runway at Mascot. Now, he's made his position on that absolutely clear over the last couple of years, and he's been entitled to make his position on that absolutely clear over the last couple of years. Member for Higgins. The, uh, the Honourable Member, member for, for Gippsland. Uh, Smith and uh, Barton and uh, one or two other honourable and indeed the Speaker who have had, uh, have had concerns in that area. And they are entitled to defend what they perceive to be the interests of their constituents as vigorously as they can. And uh, as we, as, uh, uh, as a democratic party, proceed through the processes of our decision making on this matter. And I might say, in this, on this matter, arriving and the only government that has arrived at a complete solution to the requirements of aviation at Kingsford Smith Airport, you, you, have never, you have never been able to get a position where you have a parallel runway at Kingsford Smith that actually advances the capacity of the airport to sustain operations. Your proposal, your proposal would not have done that. What you have got from our proposal is the fact that you will be able to sustain 
effectively the uh, benefits of a parallel runway operation. And you have also got the selection of a second airport site. Now, it is no wonder that you come into this place with bluster and blaggarding, with a totally irrelevant censure motion, totally unjustified by the answers that were given to you in question time, because you wish to conceal the real consequences of the decisions taken by the government and caucus yesterday, which is a major step forward in microeconomic reform in the aviation sector, which you were never capable of delivering. Never capable of delivering. And, uh, and, and the fact that you have been incapable of delivering of that, of course, is a matter of no little distress uh, to your various uh, spokesmen and indeed ministers from time to time. But we don't have to, on our side of the House, give any form of respectability at all, any form of respectability at all, to your grief in that matter. And we particularly don't have to give any explanation as far as this area, this matter, is concerned. In the question time. The uh, Minister for Higher Education made his position quite clear, and that was this. He accepted that definition, Order. that he was free to oppose Order. cabinet Minister decisions Keyong. when they went to caucus, and he is now bound by decisions Order. of the, the caucus in time regard to this matter. Has expired. And you heard it from the processes of question the time, Minister's you didn't need to hear it expired. again. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion, please say aye. 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 Contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Eyes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. and Laurie Ferguson was salivating herself. Thank you. 
Lock the doors. The question is the motion be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair and the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Wakefield and Riverina and Darling tell us for the ayes. The honourable members for Fowler and Port Adelaide tell us for the noes. Order. The result of the division is ayes 61, noes 69. The question is therefore resolved in the negative. Would honourable members kindly uh, take their normal seats?
the uh, presentation of papers. Present I've called for presentation of papers first. Oh, you acknowledge me? Uh, call, I no, I haven't, haven't acknowledged you at all. Presentation of papers. Speaker, the papers leader tables of listed on the schedule circulated to honourable members earlier today. Details of the papers will be recorded in Hansard and the votes and proceedings. I move that the House take note of the Government response to Our Future Ourselves, a report by the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Aboriginal Affairs. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the debate be adjourned. The question is the debate be adjourned. The adjourned debate be made in order of the day for next sitting. Those of that opinion, please say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I move that the House take note of the Government response to the review of the Auditor General's report on number 29 on the Aboriginal Affairs portfolio, a report by the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Aboriginal Affairs. The question is the motion be agreed to. The Honourable Leader of Opposition. Mr business. Deputy Speaker, I move that this debate be adjourned. Uh, the question of debate be adjourned. The adjourned debate be made in order of the day for the next day of sitting. Those of that opinion, please say aye. Of the contrary, no. I move that the uh, uh, House take note of the Government response to the review of the Auditor General's report number 12 on community development employment projects, a report by the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Aboriginal Affairs. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Hume. The debate is adjourned. The question is the adjourned debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those that opinion say aye. Those against no, I think the ayes have it. The I move House. that the House take note of the government response to a chance for the future, a report by the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Aboriginal Affairs. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The other member for Hume. Mr Speaker, I move that the debate be adjourned. The debate is adjourned. The question is that the adjourned debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those that opinion say aye. Those against no, I think the ayes have it. The Leader of the Opposition. I move that so much of the standing and sessional orders be suspended as would prevent the Leader of the Opposition moving forth with the following motion, that the Prime Minister no longer possesses the confidence of this House. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mr Speaker. The Leader of the House. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bell. Order. <laughs> the Minister for Immigration will cease interjecting.
lock the doors. The question is that the member be no longer heard. The eyes will move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Fowler and uh, Port Adelaide tell us for the eyes. The honourable members for Riverina, Darling and Wakefield tell us for the nose. Order. The result of the division is ayes 69, noes 62. The division is therefore resolved in the affirmative. Is the motion seconded? Yes. The Honourable Speaker, the, the, the Prime Minister the should resign for his right to the Minister of Higher Education. The question is that the member be no longer heard. All those of that opinion, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. The Honourable Member for Cowper. Camera in the gallery. Can I ask whether the members of the House have been advised that a camera would be present? And if the House has not been so advised, what are they doing there? It's not always the, it's not the, necessarily the custom to advise members. The cameras are there to take photographs of your leader and the Prime Minister. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, 
I, I take it that the honourable member for Koo Yong is not suggesting that Dr. Hewson is my leader. The honourable member for Cowper on a further point of order. Mr. Mr. Speaker, order. If the camera is there, order. The if the, the camera is there to take photographs of the of the Prime Minister, or two cameras, yes, one is now out of hiding. Of the Prime Minister and the leader of the opposition. Why isn't there one on that side to take the Leader of the Opposition? Three! Any more? Any advance on three, Mr Speaker? Well, I can assure the Honourable Member for Cowper that they're certainly not there to take photographs of him. Lock the door. The question is that the, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition be no longer heard. The eyes will move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I point the Honourable Members for Fowler and uh, Port Adelaide tell us for the eyes. The honourable members for Riverina, Darling and Wakefield tell us for the notes. Order. The result of the division is eyes 69, noes 62. The division is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The Honourable the Leader of the House. Move the motion be put. The question is that the question be now put. All those of that opinion, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that the question be now put. The eyes will move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I point the honourable members for Fowler and Port Adelaide tell us for the eyes. The honourable members for Riverina, Darling and Wakefield tell us for the nose.
The result of the division is ayes 69, noes 62. The division is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion please say aye. aye. Those against no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. the doors. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Wakefield and Riverina Darling tell us for the ayes. The honourable members for Port Adelaide and Fowler tell us for the noes. Honourable members quickly take their seats.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 61 and noes 70. The division is therefore resolved in the negative. Would honourable members please return to their seats. Honourable members, quickly resume their seats. Would honourable members resume their seats? I'm the honourable uh, member for Sturt. I have a question for you. Taking account of your duties of office to ensure that members of this House can get to and from Parliament without undue difficulty, can you assure the House that you acknowledge that you are bound by the government's decision to build the third runway at Sydney Airport? Well, I would have thought that the honourable member for Sturt might have been aware of Standing Order 152, which provides that a question without notice may be put to the Speaker relating to any matter of administration for which he is responsible. The third runway at Sydney Airport is not a matter that I'm responsible for, but I will ensure that uh, members, of course, will always expeditiously get to this House when they're needed. The Honourable Prime Minister.